Which came first, the chicken or the egg? And uh, the chicken, right? And uh, we'll come back to that question in, uh, later on in this morning's uh, sermon. But uh, as you can see up on the screen, where'd the tablet go? Oh, okay. That's all right. Uh, as you can see up on the screen, you know, we're going to talk about uh, creation this morning. And uh, every month I've been uh, preaching a sermon under the, the title, Foundational Principles. And uh, I believe today in our culture, uh, when we speak with uh, someone concerning God, concerning the Bible, if they're interested in learning about Scripture, uh, this is one of, the, one of the areas we need to start with, especially again today in, in the country we live in. Uh, we need to start with uh, creation and talking about creation. The reason why is because there's well-established systems and philosophies in our country which just simply put they contradict the Bible they contradict what the Bible says about creation and from the cradle to the grave uh, people today are taught that the world is not created that human beings are nothing more than an animal you know we're, we're intelligent animals but we're just animals and there really is no objective right or wrong. There's not really no such thing as truth. You know, you have your truth, I have my truth. And uh, we all just have to live our own individual uh, truth. And when a person is indoctrinated to think this way, when they pick up the Bible and they read the first few pages of the Bible, and the Bible clearly states that the world is created, uh, that human beings are unique, they're not merely animals, and there is objective right and wrong almost immediately out of hand. Uh, many people will reject the Bible. They will deny what the Bible says. And they deny the Bible because for years they have been conditioned to believe in atheism, essentially. You know, atheistic uh, principles. You know, one brother in Christ has written the following, and uh, he has said, sadly, the atheists of our country are doing their job better than we Christian parents are. It's time someone states the obvious, what we've done in the past hasn't worked, if you do not believe this, just walk into a church building and inquire if anyone there has children who have abandoned the faith. And you think about you know, the time we live in and circumstances concerning something as you know, simple and, and fundamental as like public school. Uh, in public schools, uh, the Bible used to be read. Uh, I was speaking um, a couple years back to an older brother. He said when he went to public school, uh, they would start each day with a hymn a prayer, they'd say the Pledge of Allegiance, um, and even before his time, the Bible was utilized in public schools to teach kids how to read. Uh, of course, none of that exists today. Uh, even something as basic as the Pledge of Allegiance in certain schools, certain areas of our country, uh, that is no longer said in school. Why? Because the Pledge of Allegiance mentions that we are one nation under God. Well, we want, want to teach that dangerous philosophy to people, uh, impressionable children, would we? You know, we don't want people to believe that we're one nation under God. And uh, of course I'm being uh, facetious, but that's you know, how people think today. Uh, perhaps if more people truly did believe that we were one nation under God, we would see more peace and civility in our country today instead of all this debate and turmoil and uh, destruction that's happened in recent uh, times. You know, think about our, our country. I'm not saying our country uh, was entirely founded on the Bible or, or entirely founded on Judeo-Christian beliefs. But anyone who just does a cursory examination of some of the things our founding father says and some of our founding documents, anyone with half a brain can see that our nation was founded in part on biblical beliefs, Christian beliefs. Our Declaration of Independence says that all men are created equal, not evolved, but created equal, and it goes on to say that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And creator, by the way, in the Declaration of Independence, is spelled with a capital C, and that is a historical practice when referring to God or some kind of word, pronoun, or word in reference to God like creator, that out of respect for him, you spell it with a capital letter. And so, you know, the creator here is not talking about like mother nature uh, or deism. It's talking about creator God. That each person, each man is endowed by their creator, God, with certain unalienable uh, rights. And so when a person rejects creation, 
and instead believes that the universe created itself. Not only is that per person cutting himself off from ever truly understanding what the Bible says, but he's also cutting himself off from the principles which have made our country great and provide wellness and peace for all people. You know, as a nation, we have drifted away. You know, by and large, uh, our nation has drifted far from its biblical moorings. Um, a, uh, in 2002, a uh, circuit court of appeals in California ruled that the phrase under God and the Pledge of Allegiance is unconstitutional. You know, think about that. And uh, again, you know, our money says in God we trust. When someone important like the president is sworn to office, he puts his hand on the Bible and, you know, swears that he's going to do, you know, right by our country. There's so many things, again, even our, our founding documents like the Declaration of Independence, so many things mention God, have references to the Bible. Uh, it's just, again, uh, not historical to say the Bible played no part or religion played no part in the formation of our country and its beliefs. The Bible expressly teaches that God created the universe, and therefore every person is accountable uh, to him. So as we think about creation this morning, let's begin by touching upon the reasonableness of creation. There is a scientific principle called causality. Uh, also called cause and effect. You know, basically that anything you see has an adequate cause or explanation for its existence. And uh, there's a logical syllog syllogism which uses this principle, and it states, nothing comes from nothing, something exists, therefore something has always existed. And to my knowledge, no one has ever proven this false. You know, no one I've ever heard of, no matter how intelligent they are, no matter how many accolades and, and academia they have, no one has ever proven this false. Nothing comes from nothing. Something is. There's things that exist in our world today. We are here. This is, this is here. This material is here. And therefore, something has always uh, existed. There really are only three explanations or three options for how our, universe, how our universe or how our world came into existence. Number one, it has always existed. That it's, that it's eternal. Number two, the universe created itself. Or number three, it was created. Uh, to my mind and everything I've looked at, there's no other explanation than those three explanations. Either the world is eternal, it created itself, or it was created. And uh, it used to be, years ago, not too long ago, that the scientific community believed that the universe and the world were eternal. That they simply, ha the, the universe has always existed, but by and large, people have abandoned that idea. And so that only leaves you with the two options, either the universe created itself or was created. And uh, again, if you look at what educated, uh, what passes for education and, and people who are in the scientific community believe today, they will say that the world created itself. But does that really make sense? Uh, is that reasonable? Is that scientific? Can something come from nothing? And again, I'm speaking from a scientific, atheistic viewpoint because maybe I didn't bring this out clearly enough. A few weeks back when we were in our first John class, we, we touched upon some of these things. You know, God has always existed, and certainly God is not nothing, if I can use a double negative. God is something. And so I'm not talking from a Christian point of view. I'm talking from a worldly uh, scientific point of view, or what passes for science today. Can something come from nothing? Can non-life produce life? Can chaos create order? And atheism and other similar ways of thinking assert all these things are true, that the universe can and indeed has created itself from nothing that non-living matter produced life, and that a chaotic uh, event and chaotic events in nature produced the orderliness uh, of our world and galaxy. And again, these assertions, they're not provable. They are not scientific. In fact, they are refuted by legitimate science, like physics. Um, and again, they're refuted by, um, uh, by logic. 
And furthermore, these, uh, um, again, these things are not, they're not provable. They require more blind faith than any you know, so-called religious person has. Um, and again, this isn't just me saying this. You know, Stephen Hawking, he's passed away in recent times, but uh, in recent, um, you know, recent history, he, he's been considered one of the most brilliant men who's, who's lived, one of the most brilliant, brilliant scientific minds. And one of his books that he's, that he's uh, published and written, he says, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. So again, there's really only three explanations for, for where our world co has come from. Either it's eternal, it created itself, or again, it was created. And so again, here, again, a very highly educated man. Uh, many people would, again, hold him in very high esteem. Uh, says just plainly, and other atheists and other scientists would say something along the same lines, that the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Um, all three of these statements, uh, all three of these assertions that I've pre presented contradict the fundamental principle, again a scientific principle, of cause and effect, of causality. Again, every effect must have an adequate uh, cause. You know, let's say you're out uh, at a pond fishing or something, and you see some decent-sized ripples in the water, and you don't see what caused it. You can make some educated guesses. Maybe, you know, uh, a branch fell off a tree into the water, or maybe some ducks are landing on the water, or something is happening to cause those, uh, those ripples that you see in the water. You know, likely, in all likelihood, you wouldn't say, well, a flea caused those things, you know, because that's just too small. It's not an adequate explanation for what you're, you're seeing. Uh, or if you're in your yard and you have a, you know, a fence and a baseball flies over the fence and lands at your feet. Again, how did that happen? You wouldn't say, well, the baseball just did that all on its own. You know, we all logically understand that something set that baseball in motion and set it flying through the air to come over your, uh, your fence. So again, this is just the basic idea of cause and effect and uh, just, I think, just good old common sense. And when you think about nothing, truly nothing, a vacuum, nothing is not an adequate cause to produce everything. You know, non-life is not an adequate cause or explanation for the living and for living creatures. Chaos is not an adequate cause to produce uh, order. You know, a tornado ripping through a, a lumber yard is not going to build a house somewhere. It's just not going to happen. Uh, in Hebrews 11, verse 1, the Bible says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, I know this is not the only verse that talks about faith, but part of our faith uh, is the result of, of evidence. That's the Bible's word for it. You know, faith in Christ, faith in the eternal God who created the universe, is not a leap into the dark. It is not just a blind faith. We'll just believe, in, even though this book is... As some people claim, oh, it's filled with contradictions and doesn't make sense and no one can understand it. Just, just believe, just have good feelings. That's not what the Bible teaches. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not uh, seen. And again, it takes more blind faith, more illogical faith, to believe that the universe created itself out of nothing. How is that scientific? How does that make any logical sense? And this uh, principle of, of cause and effect, this is stated in Scripture. Uh, look at that next verse on the screen, Hebrews 3, verse 4. It says, Every house is builded by some man, but he that built all things is God. Again, that's that basic idea of cause and effect. You see a building, you see a house, and again, it's just common sense. We automatically know, well, that didn't just pop into existence all on its own. That structure did not create itself. There had to be some person, some individual, who planned and who built that structure. And that is paralleled, if you look at Hebrews 3, verse 4, to creation in the natural world. We look at creation. We look at the natural world. We look at the, the order we see in creation. And it says, He that built all things is God. And so the world itself is evidence for God's existence. Wherever you look, whether it's on you know, the microscopic level, looking through a microscope, or you look through a telescope into the stars and into the heavens, and you look at the planets, there is orderliness. There is, there is design to everything we see. And the question is, where does that design come from? 
The psalmist put it this way in Psalm 19, verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. And so the, the psalmist said, when we look into the firmament, when we look into the sky and we see the planets and the stars, that shows the handiwork of God. You know, the earth orbits the sun every 365 days without fail. Again, there's a recognizable pattern there. There's an orderliness there. When you consider the clockwork precision of our galaxy and how uh, astronomers, how they can, you know, calculate things like lunar eclipses years and years in advance, that's not chaos. That's orderliness. That's precision. It's like a clock. Well, where does that orderliness uh, come from? Is it the result of blind, chaotic, mindless chance? Again, that just doesn't make logical sense. It's not an adequate cause for the effect. Uh, do you believe that the clock demands a clockmaker? Again, the Bible says plainly, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Denying our world was created simply is not reasonable. And again, you really only have three options. Either the universe is eternal, it created itself, or it was created. Now this brings us to our second point this morning. Let's talk about the ramifications of creation. Because I think there are people in the scientific community, uh, in fact, I'll show you in just a moment, there are people who understand that the atheistic, uh, overarching, uh, the, the theory of evolution uh, has tons of holes and it doesn't make any scientific or logical sense, but they just don't want to accept the fact that the only other conclusion is that someone or something had to create the, the universe. Because there's, again, there's ramifications, uh, implications to say that our universe was created. You know, that brings up the question, well, who created it? What created it? Again, the Bible is very clear. In Psalm 24, verse 1, it says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all they that dwell therein. And this is kind of a, a side note here. But again, God is our creator. Uh, he is our maker. He spoke the world into existence. And the psalmist you know, clearly said, the earth is the Lord's, and he goes on to say, and they that dwell therein. Again, this is kind of a side note, but there's some people who have this idea that uh, a person's not accountable to God until they're baptized, until they become a Christian. That's foolishness. That's not right. Every single person, whether they're the most stone-cold atheist you ever met or the most ardent believer you've ever met, every single person belongs to God. He is our creator. Uh, he is our maker. If a human being is created, well, what does that mean about us, what we are? Uh, do we have a spirit? Do we have a, a soul? And so there's, you know, existential questions inherent with the idea of, of creation. You know, where did I come from? What am I? Uh, why am I? And a person's worldview, uh, again, their view of, of especially creation and our origin, uh, a person's worldview is drastically going to change the answers to those questions. Again, the atheist says you're just an animal. You, you have as much intrinsic value as a cockroach. And I'm not kidding. That's why uh, atheism, when it's followed out to its logical conclusions, is so dangerous for a country, uh, for a people, uh, because if someone is not profitable or, or deemed insignificant, like, let's say, uh, an unborn child, well, let's just kill it. Let's just get rid of it. After all, we're just animals, and uh, you know, the strongest animal can do whatever it wants to do. And so a person's worldview is drastically going to affect his view of himself and other uh, human beings. You know, a Buddhist answer to the questions of who am I, what am I, where did I come from, and so on, they're going to be drastically different from our answers to those uh, questions. And so another ramification concerning uh, creation, implication of, of creation is morality. And at first, this is one of the appealing things, that I think especially young people, you know, sometimes, you know, we'll, we'll use the phrase, you know, they're, they're young, they need, to, they need to sow their wild oats and things along those, along those lines. Well, that's one of the things that's appealing to uh, atheism. You know, because, you know, if, if there's a higher power, if there's something that caused our existence, then that would mean that we are somehow accountable to that higher uh, power. 
And so the atheist believes that there is no God, that there's nothing greater or beyond humanity. You know, human being is the, basically the, the, uh, the highest, a human being is the highest authority in the universe. So there's nothing above humanity to say, well, this or that is wrong. I can just do basically whatever I want. And uh, historically, atheists have, have said this. Uh, Aldous Huxley, who was uh, an atheist, he, he said this. For myself, as no doubt for most of my contemporaries, the philosophy of meaninglessness was essentially an instrument of liberation. So what kind of liberation is he talking about? He goes on to say, the liberation we desired was simultaneously liberation from a certain political and economic system, and notice he says, liberation from a certain system of morality. We objected to the morality because it interfered with our sexual freedom. And so that's appealing to, you know, a young, you know, person filled with hormones. Oh, hey, you don't have to believe in God. God doesn't exist. There's no right and wrong. Just do whatever you want to do. And uh, again, there's atheists who've gone on record basically saying that they object to creation because they just want the freedom to do whatever they want in that, in, uh, that area of life. And so there's, there's lots of implications. And I, I think atheists are well aware of these implications uh, to, to believe that there is no God, the universe created itself out of nothing, that human beings are really the only authority in, in the world. And, uh, of course, the Bible teaches the very opposite of all of those things, that we were indeed created. God is the highest authority, and God has certain expectations for how we conduct ourselves um, in the world. And so lastly, very, very quickly, I'm going to go through what the Bible says concerning uh, creation. Just hit a, a few points here. And I want you to be aware that if you ever listen to a debate or a talk where uh, an atheist might uh, put forth principles concerning uh, uh, atheism and agnosticism, and he's debating a creationist, uh, people often use a tactic called bait and switch. Uh, they will convince you to believe in one thing, but then in the middle of that discussion, sometimes without you being aware of it, they will switch what they're talking about. And uh, hear me out on this, because I don't want any misunderstandings. I do believe in the basic principles of evolution. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, living creatures can and do change. I think that's obvious. You know, if you look at a uh, Chihuahua and you look at a Great Dane, obviously among those two dogs, there's some differences, right? In case you don't know, we all know what a Chihuahua is, right? Great Danes can, like, get this big. They're huge. So obviously somewhere along the line of, of them being bred and so on, uh, changes have taken place. And what atheists will do is they will convince you of that. They'll convince you, look at these animals, look at all uh, these animals and how they've changed over time. And I think most people would agree, well, yeah, there's been some changes among those animals uh, over time. And this is commonly referred to uh, as microevolution. I believe in microevolution. Uh, now, the problem is there's, there's clearly a limit to how much an animal can change. And this is what I don't agree with, and this is where, you know, the bait and switch comes from, because someone will convince you that microevolution is true, but then they'll switch definitions and ta start talking about a different kind of evolution. And so, again, there's a, you know, handsome little chihuahua dog. You know, given enough time, can that animal, can that chihuahua, can it evolve, can it change into a fish? into a, a lizard, you know, give it billions of years. Can it change into an insect? You see, this is no longer talking about microevolution. This is, again, what some people would, might call macroevolution, a, a large uh, change. And so, again, atheists will try to convince you and say, well, look at the changes in these dogs, or look at the changes in these, these birds, these finches. And the Galapagos Islands and how, you know, each bird lives on a different island and they have different sized beaks and whatnot. You see those changes? Well, this is proof that eventually those, those birds or this dog can change into a completely different kind of animal. That's a whole different kind of definition. Uh, and again, the, the definition of one class of animal changing into a completely different class of animal, that's not true. I do not believe in that. Again, it's not scientific, it's never been observed, it's never been tested, there's no fossil evidence for that. In fact, the fossil record uh, teaches the very opposite. You know, supposedly there's been these animals uh, that have 
existed for millions and millions of years, and when you look at the fossil record, they look exactly the same as they do today. You know, there's fossils of sharks and alligators and all kinds of things where they have not changed one iota. They look exactly like sharks and alligators if you look at fossils. And so again, people who didn't want to try and persuade you that evolution is true, they believe given enough time, a mammal can transform into a fish or reptile or an insect. And again, there's all kinds of things in our school systems, in the media and popular culture, which you, from, again, cradle to grave in our country, people are being taught this. Uh, have you ever seen, you know, the Jurassic Park movies? You know, I really like those movies. I don't know if anyone has any complaints about that or not. I especially like the first one. And uh, if you ever watch the original Jurassic Park, you'll notice in that movie, of course, it's just, a, you know, a movie, but you'll notice in that movie over and over again, if you, if, sometimes if you're not looking for these things, it just goes right over your head. But if you listen for it, Probably at least a dozen times in that movie, they talk about how dinosaurs evolved into birds over and over and over again. Again, that makes about as much sense as this little dog, given enough time, changing into a fish, into a lizard, into a bird, into anything else. There is no evidence for that. It's absolutely ridiculous. I mean, it's just so moronic. I don't even know how to put it into, into words. And again, scientists themselves understand about all the flaws and all the illogical and unscientific consistencies in the theory of, of evolution. Here is an uh, excerpt from an article which mentions uh, the magazine New Scientist. And it says this concerning, this is a, I think, well-established scientific magazine. Uh, and it says, although New Scientist openly embraces the general theory of evolution, the journal has admitted the limits uh, that limits of change exist. There are limits as to how much a human or a particular kind of animal can change. Centuries of scientific observation have testified repeatedly to the boundaries of change. Dogs will only get so fast, grow so tall, or become so strong. They have never crossed their inherent genetic barrier to become a cat a bat or a rat. As the Bible has testified for over 3,500 years, God created all the various kinds of animals to, re to re reproduce according to their kind. Now again, think about that. What is this scientific magazine telling you? It's telling you evolution is not true. You know, if there is a limit to how much an animal can change, then obviously all the life and animals we see today did not come from a single-celled organism. Because in order for that to happen, there could not be a limit to, to that change. And again, if you look at, if you've ever studied this, there's tons of people in the scientific communities themselves who say this theory is not true. Atheistic ideas about the world simply are not compatible with the Bible. Uh, the theory of evolution is not compatible with the Bible. The world creating itself out of nothing, the spontaneous generation of life, life just happening all on its own, again, from just dead matter that exists in the world that's not provable, not scientific, and the theory of macroevolution, the overarching idea that a single cell organism slowly evolved into uh, you know, multi-celled organisms and then the flatworms and then the fish and the fish evolved into a reptile and the reptile grew legs and became a lizard. Uh, or sorry, the fish grew legs and became a lizard, and then that lizard became a mammal, and that mammal slowly evolved into an ape-like creature, and now here we are today. Uh, that idea, again, is not compatible with the Bible. And there are people, even Christians, who attempt to combine the scriptures with this worldly philosophy. And, uh, you know, there might be people who say they believe in both, who, are tr who try to... Uh, harmonize evolution, atheism with what the Bible says. Regardless of all that, these two ideas are mutually exclusive. They cannot be combined. You know, and if you do try to combine them, you know, ultimately you're going to compromise one or the other. And it's going to be a compromising of what the Bible clearly says. So again, I ask that question, what came first, the chicken or the egg? And the Bible's answer to that is the chicken. I think John said over that at the beginning. You know, the chicken came first. And according to the Bible, when you look at Genesis 1, 
It clearly states that God created the animals according to their kind. He created fully developed animals. When God created the world, he created it complete and fully functioning. And if you think about it, there's thousands of, of symbiotic relationships uh, which exist between animals and other creatures. You know, even in, in human beings, uh, our gut is filled with all kinds of bacteria and little you know, creatures uh, that help us and benefit us. And uh, those symbiotic, uh, as far as I know, those symbiotic re relationships have never been explained by evolution. You know, how can, how can there be so many of these symbiotic relationships uh, in which one creature depends on another uh, if we slowly evolve over millions, uh, millions of, of years? And so when God created the world, he uh, created it complete and fully functioning. And in one example of this, uh, even though on day eight of the period of the beginning of creation on day eight, you know, Adam turned one day old, but when we look at the Bible, he's described as a fully functioning male adult. And uh, this is one explanation for, for why the earth and the universe may have the appearance of, uh, of extreme uh, age or being very ancient, but in reality uh, is not. And you know, some people talk about uh, starlight and measuring you know, the light from the stars. You know, apparently, there's stars out in space that are so far away that they've actually burned up. They've burned out and they've exploded and they no longer exist. But they're so far away that the light is still reaching us, and so we still see the light. And people say, oh, well, that took you know, trillions of years for that to happen, that, that light to still be uh, coming to us. Uh, there are some reasonable explanations for why there's things in our universe that appear to be very ancient. Now, when we think about God and creation, you know, of course, the Bible talks about God being almighty, God being omnipotent. You know, he could have created our universe any way he wanted to. You know, he could have caused everything to exist in one millisecond. He could have stretched it out over billions or trillions of years if that's what he wanted to do. Um, however, the Bible, again, just plainly teaches that God created the universe in a period of six normal days, and then he rested on the seventh. Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3, and so on, are not figurative. And again, there's, there's beliefs, there's philosophies, there's systems in our country which are uh, well established and they contradict the Bible. And there's people in our country, uh, in our culture, who want to attack the Bible. And this is an attack on Scripture. It's an attack on God. It's an attack on the authority of Jesus Christ. When people say Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, that record is figurative, or it's poetic, or it's mythological. It's anything but what it actually says. And when we look at the Bible, later authors and people in, in Scripture, when they refer back to the book of Genesis, and they refer back to the events recorded in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, and so on, they always talk about it as a factual account, a historical account. Now consider Jesus' words in uh, again, this, this directly relates to Christ, his teachings, and his authority. You know, concerning Jesus Christ, it says in John 1, verse 3, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Now, again, this is a literal understanding of Genesis, that Jesus, God incarnate, is the one who created everything. Without him, nothing would exist, is what it tells us. He made everything, and without him, uh, was not anything made that was made. You know, we read about uh, the genealogy of Jesus Christ, and there's one in Matthew, and there's also another uh, genealogy of Jesus in Luke's account, Luke chapter 3. And by the way, they are different. Uh, in Matthew's account, it traces the genealogy through Jesus' adopted legal father, Joseph. And in Luke 3, it tra traces his genealogy through his mother, Mary. And in Luke's account, in Luke 3... It goes back in time, in the very uh, last uh, verse there, Luke 3, verse 38, speaking about Christ, and it says, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. Now, did Jesus, descending from Adam, did he descend from a mythological figure? Is Adam just some kind of mythological person, or is he a descendant of a real person in history named Adam? And uh, again, people who want to say it's mythological, they're attacking the person of Christ and the authority uh, he has. And think about other people mentioned in his genealogical record. Matthew 1, verse 1, 
You know, Jesus is the son of Abraham, the son of David. Are they also mythological figures, or are they real people in history named Abraham and, and David? You know, Deuteronomy, also authored by Moses. You know, Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 32, Moses said to the people of Israel as he's preparing them to enter the land of Canaan and conquer the land of Canaan, he says, For ask now the days that are past, which were before thee, since the day that God created man upon the earth. And then the verse continues. But clearly, when you look at Moses' statements, he believes God created man upon the earth, just as it's recorded, as he recorded by inspiration in Genesis 1. Again, consider the teachings of Christ, Mark 10, verse 6. He said, from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Again, this is a reference back to Genesis 1 and 2. Jesus made literal application that God literally made in the beginning a man and a woman. In this context, he's speaking about you know, marriage and how they're joined together um, in marriage. Well, Jesus is saying, well, going back to that myth, you know, God created a man and a woman. Let's make some you know, kind of poetic, allegorical application from that. No, he made literal application. In Acts 17, 24, it says, God made the world and all things therein. Seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, uh, he dwelleth not in temples made with hands. The Bible is replete. That's all I'll give you for, for now. But you know, the Bible is absolutely filled with these passages and these verses that when referring back to Genesis, it always teaches it's literal. That God literally made the world and everything in it. Now, I'm not speaking to someone who's a new convert or someone who comes out of the world and you know, might have some kind of confusion about this. You know, that's understandable, and that's why we need to cover this topic with new converts. And that's why we as, as Christians, we need to teach this diligently um, to our children, the world and the culture that we live in. But someone who claims to be a follower of Christ for years, you know, put simply, people who believe in the Big Bang and evolution do not believe in the Bible. They do not believe in the Bible. They do not believe in the teachings of Jesus Christ. And every person must make up his or her mind to either believe in a purposeful creation or in chaotic happenstance. They can't believe in both. They are mutually exclusive. They are categorically different. And it's illogical to attempt to combine them. And uh, again, as I mentioned before, uh, the atheists in our country, they have been highly successful in spreading their, their beliefs. And how many souls today have been led away, or how many souls have been negatively affected to, to reject the Bible, reject God, because of atheistic teachings? And again, atheism is often tied to science. It's often associated with science. And as Christians, and I'll speak for myself, I don't reject science. I love science. You know, I went to public school, and I went to... Uh, I went to community college for a few years before I went to Bible college. One of my favorite topics in school was physics. I love physics. That's real, you know, science. I never got into chemistry, but chemistry, that's real science. People who have all these philosophical notions about what happened, you know, before, before time as we know it and all these this things, it's not science. It's just philosophy. It's just basically a religious view, a world view. Uh, creation is a foundational principle when we study the scriptures. And the events in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, and so on, they set the stage for the rest of the Bible. Again, I just want to emphasize that all attacks on the credibility of Genesis, they are attacks on the credibility of Jesus Christ. Jesus made literal application from the first book of the Bible. And we look at Genesis, it teaches us about the origin of the stars and planets in our world, in our universe. It teaches, about, teaches us about the origin of plant life and animal life, the origin of human life, the origin of marriage, and sadly, the origin of sin, and why we even you know, need a savior today. You know, uh, there are people today who very clearly have an agenda, and they want to compromise your view and our country's view on the first few pages uh, concerning the first few pages of what the Bible uh, says. And when you think about atheism, it does not do anyone any good. It doesn't give you hope for the future. 
doesn't uh, teach you how to live any kind of good or productive or moral life. In fact, it does the very opposite. It's inherently dangerous. You know, we, we look to the natural world. Does the lion have any compunction or remorse uh, when he kills and eats uh, a deer? You know, nature, you know, dog eats dog. You know, the, the might makes right. The bigger, more powerful animal can do what he or she chooses uh, to do. And again, when we start to view ourselves as animals, that, again, degrades all kind of morality when people truly believe that and bring it to its logical uh, conclusions. It drastically devalues human life. The world and mankind, according to the Bible, were created with purpose. Your life has meaning. You have intrinsic value as a human being. And in fact, God loves you so much and values you so much that he willingly gave up his son to die for your sins so that you can be forgiven, so that you can live with him for all eternity. That's how much God loves you. That's, that's the value that God has bestowed on your life and in all human life. And I encourage you this morning to always trust in God, always trust in his word, and have confidence in what Genesis says and what the Bible says about creation. If there's anyone here this morning who has not yet put their faith in Christ and became, become a disciple, then we encourage you to believe in him, to trust in him, to repent of your sins, confess your faith in him, and then put him on in baptism and then arise from that watery grave, as Brother Tom mentioned, uh, having your sins washed away by the blood of Christ, and then to continue in the faith and to continue in your study and application of what this awesome book says.